With his team, the uh, next speaker, uh, Pierre Magistretti, has been working on the mechanisms that uh, define the coupling between brain activity and energy consumption. He's the Dean of the Division of Biological and Environmental Sciences and Engineering up at KAUST, not far from here. He's also a director of the Brain, uh, Brain Mind Institute at uh, EPFL in Lausanne. Please welcome Pierre Magistretti. Welcome. Uh, I would like first to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Walid Jufali and Professor Hilal Lachouel for uh, their invitation to, uh, for me to give um, uh, a lecture on uh, a topic of brain physiology that has occupied me for the last two decades, which is a brain uh, is really a small part of our body, only 2%, and yet whatever index you take of energy metabolism, be it glucose utilization, oxygen consumption, or a blood flow, it, it uses uh, 20 to 25 percent, so 10 times more than its actual weight. So why is it so, and why is it interesting to study this? Uh, and I will tell you, hopefully you will agree, uh, that there are interesting mechanisms to study, uh, to understand there. Now, over a century ago, uh, the great uh, neuroscientist Charles Sherrington actually unveiled another aspect of brain energy metabolism by realizing that, in fact, the regulation of brain metabolism is extremely uh, precise in space and time. He uh, concluded in one of his uh, fundamental papers that the brain uh, possesses an intrinsic mechanism by which its vascular supply can be varied locally in correspondence with local variations of functional activity. Meaning that whenever, it's like a muscle, whenever the muscle is active, it will require more energy. Now, this is interesting for the physiological point of view, but it's also uh, a fundamental uh, feature that has allowed the development of functional brain imaging. Uh, because of these highly regulated, in space and time, uh, uh, energy metabolism in register with synaptic activity. Now, this functional brain imaging technique essentially measure either blood flow or oxygen consumption or glucose delivery or other aspects of circulation, which, such as those that can be detected with functional MRI. So uh, it is quite critical to better understand the basis, the cellular and molecular basis of brain energy metabolism or neuroenergetics. Now, let's ask a few questions. What is so costly in brain function? And how is energy delivered and produced? So what is so costly? And this graph, I, I'll make it very simple. Uh, you, you, on the x-axis, you see essentially um, uh, activity, neuronal activity in part of a particular transmitter, a glutamate, which makes up 80% of the synapses. So here, the more on the right side, the more activity there is. And here on the y-axis, you have glucose utilization. So you see a linear correlation. The more neurotransmission, the more glucose used. And this point is interesting because here, essentially, there is no neurotransmission. Actually, the EEG, this is an experimental animal, is flat. There is no electrical activity. And yet, there is still about 10% of energy used. And that's the basal housekeeping uh, energy consumption. All the rest, and so we can say that essentially 90% of energy utilization by the brain is related to signaling, to communicating between neurons. Now, but what, what are the signals that neurons produce? Well, essentially two kinds, either action potentials, that is the propagation of an electrochemical signal along the axon, or synaptic potentials, the exchange of information between neurons mediated by neurotransmitters. Well, it turns out that a number of studies now have shown that essentially 80% of the energy consumed by signaling, which is, again, very considerable, is due to this communication between neurons. So in a way, by monitoring brain energy metabolism, one has a very good approximation of what's going on at the synapse. These electrochemical signals that are propagated or produced at the synapse are due to the transfer of charges in order to maintain excitability and the ability to keep uh, signaling capacities, 
uh, actually the batteries have to be recharged. The ions have to be pushed back uh, inside or outside the cell. And this is operated by ion pumps, which cost a lot of energy. So this is really the key mechanism that uses energy in the brain. Now, how is energy delivered to match these energetic needs? Well, there is a pretty striking image, which I really always like to show, and this is the density of capillaries uh, in the brain. Uh, believe it or not, depending on the species, we're talking about kilometers of capillaries within the brain. The brain is the most highly vascularized uh, organ of, of, of the body, and, and that's how energy is delivered, through the blood. And the energy is very simple, it's like muscle. It's essentially glucose and oxygen. Now, how is it used? And here it's something that uh, our lab contributed uh, to better understand. It's actually uh, produced by a particular cell type called the astrocytes because they have this star-shaped uh, <clears throat> uh, arrangement. So actually what these cells do, and this is a more artistic rendering of, of the idea, is that these cells, the astrocytes, they have processes on the capillaries, the source of energy, and they have other processes, and this was shown much later, uh, around the synapses. So they can sense synaptic activity and then provide, through a signaling mechanism that we have characterized in, in the 90s, bring in uh, glucose and other metabolites into uh, the brain parenchyma. Now, again, you will not, not be surprised, given this relationship that I showed you a moment ago, that the main signal for coupling neuronal activity to uh, delivery of energy is actually glutamate. And this slide where you see a neuron, a synapse here, an astrocyte and a capillary, shows that actually it is, yet it is glutamate that signals to the astrocytes through a series of uh, metabolic cascades uh, the import of glucose and the processing of glucose into a substrate which was a big surprise when we found it, which is lactate, like lactic acid. So in, essentially the coupling between synaptic activity and the delivery of energy is uh, operated by these cells, the astrocytes. And this is now known as the astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle, whereby glutamate, 80% of the synapses use glutamate, signal to the astrocytes, of course they signal to other neurons, but they also signal to astrocytes to import energy under the form of glucose and then provide lactate, uh, which can then be transformed and used by, by the neurons. <clears throat> now, there is an interesting feature about energy metabolism. Actually, energy can also be stored uh, and then mobilized uh, when necessary in the brain. In the, in the, for the body, we have the liver, which accumulates glucose under the form of glycogen. In the brain, actually, astrocytes, again, these cells that we like a lot, uh, contain, are the only cells that contain glycogen. So the brain has some energy storage under the form of glycogen in astrocytes. Well, a few years ago, we showed that uh, at least two neurotransmitters now, not glutamate, but either noradrenaline or a peptide, VIP, which, by the way, is contained in these bipolar cells that define sorts of cortical columns, which are now, for example, heavily modeled by the Human Brain Project. Well, these VIP neurons can produce, uh, can mobilize glycogen from astrocytes, and what we proposed was that they can then provide energy for an active column. So <clears throat> the end result of, of, of this uh, set of, uh, of, of data is that uh, the brain can, uh, neurons, sorry, can provide signals to the astrocytes to either import glucose from the blood and produce lactate, this is stimulated by glutamate, or to mobilize their energy stores from glycogen and also produce lactate. So it turns out that this lactate is quite an interesting molecule, and you will see not only because it produces energy, but because of another re reason, which we uh, unveiled a couple of years ago, where we showed that actually lactate, or energy, can also be, uh, provide information, a signal. And we showed that actually this astrocyte-produced lactate is actually shuttled to neurons and is necessary, now we're talking about the higher brain function, is necessary for memory. So now here you have a relatively uninteresting molecule, such as lactate, produced by your possibly relatively uninteresting cell type, the astrocyte, which is necessary for memory. So maybe they can become more interesting. 
Now, this was shown in experiments in which we, uh, uh, we tested the ability of uh, mice to learn not to go in the a dark uh, compartment where they would get uh, a small electric shock. So, usually they go very quickly inside because they like dark, but uh, once they have learned that they get a shock, they actually take a very long time to get in. Well, if we blocked the mobilization of glycogen with drugs that we injected in the brain, in the hippocampus, a region involved in memory, or if we block the transfer of lactate from astrocytes to neurons, we blocked memory, we block another aspect of memory at the cellular level, long-term potentiation, and we block the formation of a number of genes that are involved in neuronal plasticity. And we could rescue all of this by injecting lactate. So uh, it turned out, with, uh, we were surprised, and, and this was not mimicked by glucose, by the way. So it was not just by providing energy. There was something special with lactate that was inducing uh, some genes that we know are involved in plasticity and which are necessary for memory. And very recently, using the, the very high-performing uh, platform uh, at KAUST, a genomic platform, we now have identified 36 genes 36 genes that are induced by lactate selectively. And now we're trying to understand what is the function of their genes. So it looks like lactate actually uh, is turning on a program uh, that uh, <coughs> uh, is related to plasticity. But the interesting point of view from the neuroenergetic uh, uh, perspective, if you wish, is that the same molecule, lactate, provides energy and provides information. Now, what for the future? What is there for the future? Uh, and I have listed here three, um, three dimensions which I think um, could guide us in developing, actually not only studies in, in, in neuroenergetics, but I would say in general about uh, brain function. Uh, we have a very strong collaboration started between KAUST and EPFL on uh, modeling this neuron glia vasculature uh, <coughs> uh, relationship and this uh, project involves uh, Henry Markham and Felix uh, Schurman at EPFL, and then Aikile Vashleo, uh, Madhu, and Corrado Kali at, uh, at KAUST. And so the idea is eventually to be able to uh, simulate the activation of, uh, uh, of neurons and then see what uh, uh, happens in terms of um, import of glucose and lactate production. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, we will miss something. And then using this approach that the Human Brain Project use, uses, going back and forth from experiment to modeling, eventually uh, produce a, a, a viable model with the ambition to, uh, in, in, in this series sequence of events, to actually uh, provide um, a, a virtualization of uh, this uh, functional brain imaging. The idea being that we can then tweak many of the variables in this coupling and see what the result will be on the imaging signal. And this should help us better understand uh, what is possibly going wrong in certain pathologies in which functional brain imaging signals are perturbed. So neurons actually are activated by uh, this, um, when neurons are activated, there is an increase in water inflow, which then changes the refractive index. And in fact, this technique is so sensitive that we can compare the, electrochemic, uh, the electrophysiology recording of, of a given uh, uh, response of a neurons with the change in phase just monitored with holography. The big advantage, of course, is that uh, with electrophysiology, you can record one neuron at a time. With this optical method, you can record all the neurons that are in your field of view. Now, the last point I want to make, uh, which I think uh, uh, is very important, and, and Patrick Avisher mentioned this already this morning, is the importance of developing new technologies, nanotechnologies in particular, for, and this is in the case of neuro uh, energetics, in vivo chemical detection, detections of energy substrates of chemicals in the brain. So what we need is a new technology with high spatial resolution, at least the micron, temporal resolution, the millisecond, and also multiscale. And this is very important because we have to be able at the same time to record information from single cells within the context of a network. And putting these two multiscale levels together will be extremely informative. So uh, I'm uh, reaching uh, the end of my talk. I, I, I hope I 
I convinced you that uh, better knowing uh, the cellular and molecular underpinnings of uh, brain energy metabolism in relation to neuronal activity and actually becoming more and more interested in these non-neuronal cells which for a long time were thought to be just glue, hence their name glia, is of interest to better understand uh, the function of the brain. And uh, I would like to just add the last point and that is that you know, modeling uh, will also help us possibly to develop energy efficient uh, computers. I know this is a long-term challenge, but if we better understand how the brain can do its computing uh, operations with a very low energy consumption, because don't forget that the brain, for doing what it does, uses about 20 to 60 watts, which is has nothing to do with the megawatts that the current computers use. So if we possibly better understand the basis of neuroenergetics and computational power of the brain, maybe we can develop uh, neuro-inspired or glia-inspired computers for the future. Thank you.